C'est la vie. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. As I said, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll try to answer the questions at the end. Um, and if Amber will keep track of those, that would be very helpful. I am recording this, um, so hopefully I'll be able to post it online for those that missed it. And maybe I can get it onto the Baton Rouge Arvin website that way, or Facebook page that way. All right, so I'm going to share my screen now. And we'll get into the heart of it. All right, does everybody see the screen? Okay. And just the people that aren't don't have uh, the people that have video going can just wave their hand if they can see the screen or give me a thumbs up. Colette yeah, wants to know if you're going to record it. Yes, this is it is being recorded. It's a Zoom meeting. Clicked on record. And we are here to talk about hummingbirds. Um, and uh, a fascinating subject, obviously. I always tell people that if I do a program on hummingbirds, I'm pretty okay. sure that I'm gonna fill the room. And um, that has definitely been the case when I've done <clears throat> um, these programs live. And now, as I said, we had over 320,000 people uh, that have seen <clears throat> this uh, Facebook event on, uh, or this event on Facebook, so obviously it was shared uh, far and wide. Years. All right, so the, the hummingbird, as you may know, is the smallest bird in the world. Um, in fact, this bird that you see up here on the left is the bee hummingbird, which is just over two inches tall and is actually the smallest bird in the entire world, the bee hummingbird of Cuba. He is just as spicy as any other uh, hummingbird. Um, however, uh, this particular individual is one that um, we saw in Cuba, and Cuba is the only place that the bee hummingbird occurs. Um, I went to Cuba, um, uh, beginning of last year to see some of the endemic species there, including the bee hummingbird. He was just adorable. And then the giant hummingbird that lives in the Andes Mountains in Peru is about the size of a cardinal. Uh, so you can he see this, this photo that Matt Brady took with the giant hummingbird in the hand and see how large it is. There are actually over 340 species of hummingbirds in the world. They're all found in the Americas, North America, Central America, South America. So if somebody in Europe or Asia says that they saw a hummingbird, uh, that is not the case. They may have seen something else um, that, that takes that ecological niche um, in the other continents, but hummingbirds are only found in the Americas and mostly in the tropics around the equator. Um, but how many do we think uh, do people think that we have that breed here in Louisiana? see the chat. How about six? I started the video. I unmuted myself. <laughs> I know I'm muted. Okay. Find my chat screen here. Amber, do we have some guesses on how many? I can't see the chat screen for some reason. Yeah, we have um, one, one, three, one, one. The people that say one probably have seen my presentation. <laughs> oh, and a six. Because <laughs> uh, the answer is one. So we have, we have one that, that breeds here in Louisiana. Oh, that breeds, okay. Yeah, we have others that occur here but only one that. Um, oh, okay. All right. So, and that is the ruby throated hummingbird. Uh, so this is the most common hummingbird in the eastern part of the U.S., east of the Rockies, basically. Uh, it is the only one that breeds in Louisiana. The male has the ruby red throat, 
um, also called a gorget, G-O-R-G-E-T, and a dark forked tail. And then the female has a plain, clear white throat and white tips on the tail. And people might see these two different hummingbirds in their yard and, um, and think that they have different, two different species of hummingbird, but they are the same. They are male and female, so they're sexually dimorphic, like a, a northern cardinal is. Uh, the ruby throat does not always look red, and this, this, um, this puzzles people sometimes. So you see, this is the exact same bird. Uh, this, these photos were taken a couple of seconds apart. So in one uh, photo, he's looking straight onto the camera, and he's flaring out his throat. Um, that the throat, uh, the structure of the feathers and the way it reflects and refracts the light, um, is actually what makes it look red. So it truly is an optical illusion. Uh, that red is not created from pigment, but from structure. And then when he turns his head the other way, he's calmer, he's not flaring out those red feathers, those gorget feathers, the throat looks black. Um, so, and people, there is a black chinned hummingbird. People will say, well, I must have a black chinned hummingbird because it doesn't have any red, but it is actually the ruby throat without the red flare of the gorget going on. It's all about the light. So all of their feathers have some iridescence um, in different light. The bird may appear more yellow or gray or brown or gold, um, but you can be pretty sure that in Louisiana, in the spring or in the summer, um, these are almost certainly ruby throated hummingbirds. So now in the other times of the year, we're getting into fall, into winter, you might have other hummingbirds and I'll talk about those a little bit later, but in the spring or summer, you're almost certainly going to have ruby throats. So if we have the male has the gorget and the female has the clear throat, what do we have here? So we have the, um, the white tips on the tail, but the throat is not, um, is not red like the adult male. This is actually a young male. So if you saw um, when he was facing in the, to the front, he just had a couple of speckles on his throat. It looks like he kind of has a five o'clock shadow. And that's exactly right. He's growing into his beard, uh, if you will, growing into his gorget. And just a couple of those um, pin feathers, uh, gorget feathers have unfurled and give him some red spots on his throat. Hummingbirds are the feistiest little critters on earth. They do not like each other. They do not like you, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Uh, they're all very, very territorial. All of them will try to chase away competition um, for those food resources or breeding territory. And the male hummingbird actually uses those colors and his voice to warn away uh, competitors. And if that doesn't work, he'll start dive bombing. And you've probably witnessed it, this at your feeders sometimes. They get very um, possessive of, of feeders. Sometimes you can actually hear them collide. They will rarely hurt each other. I actually had one um, bump another uh, hummingbird into my pool one time and she was mad. Ooh, she was mad. <laughs> she came up fussing about that. Um, I actually heard a, to a story one time. Uh, a friend of mine said that she was walking it into the DMV in Baton Rouge and she saw a gentleman about to step on something and she looked down and it was a hummingbird that he was about to step on. And he said, and she rushed over there and said, excuse me, sir, please, please, what are you doing? And he said, well, I have to kill it. It's a stinging bird. Um, so apparently at some point in his life, he was told that because of that sharp beak, um, that this was a stinging bird and it was dangerous, but that is absolutely not the case. Uh, hummingbirds cannot hurt you. Uh, I've heard, you know, wives' tales of people at attending, um, banding sessions and such where they said that, you know, a hummingbird pierced somebody's ear. Uh, no, no. If you got poked by a hummingbird, it might feel like somebody poked you with a fingernail. It certainly wouldn't be enough to poke a hole in you. So um, in order to reduce this territorial nature of hummingbirds in your yard, uh, as a general rule of thumb, you can put up several feeders out of sight of each other 
to try to minimize the fighting, um, but just know that you're not gonna solve this problem. It's just the nature of hummingbirds. So what do hummingbirds eat? Any guesses? Nectar. They do drink nectar, but they are primarily flycatchers. Uh, they eat insects and small spiders. Um, their bill actually opens up just like any other bird bill uh, so that they can catch these small insects. Uh, when I started birding, I thought that a hummingbird um, bill was like a straw and they just suck nectar out of flowers. And it turns out I was completely wrong. Uh, they can open their bill uh, just like any other bird. Um, and their tongue is, um, is very long and, and skinny and comes right out of the bill. So this is a young broad bill hummingbird going after a gnat. Let me go back up to that for a second. <clears throat> This is a quick video that shows a little gnat going by and the, the hummingbird chasing it. So you would think that they, even though they're a tiny bird, it would take an awful lot of gnats to fill up, <laughs> to fill up a bird. And that the uh, hummingbird tongue is quite impressive. Uh, it is basically as long as uh, the bill is. Uh, there it is sticking it out, sticking out the tongue. The tongue actually has tendrils on the end uh, and it basically slurps the nectar back into their mouth, um, just like a cat or a dog does. Uh, so they just uh, do a continuous, and as hummingbirds do everything very fast, continuous slurping of nectar and pulling it into their mouth with their tongue. The tongue is so long that the internal mechanism, it actually has to wrap around inside the skull in order to fit inside um, the, the head of the hummingbird. It can't fit in the mouth. So that's pretty impressive. And of course, hummingbirds do eat nectar as well. Nectar provides the sugar for energy so that they can do all this wonderful fly catching. Um, each bird might visit, visit hundreds of flowers in a day. Uh, they prefer tubular shaped flowers, but they will visit any, um, any type of flower that has nectar. They'll check on flowers just to see if they do have nectar. And our feeders are basically substitute flowers. They don't necessarily have to have this shape um, as shown in this slide, uh, the flower shape. Um, as long as they uh, have the port for the nectar, the hummingbird will explore it and find the, the nectar and then it thinks it's just a um, a bottomless flower, so to speak. So what kind of uh, feeder should you use? Now, the most important thing is to use a feeder that you can clean easily. Um, you want it to be able to come completely apart so that you can clean all of the parts. This particular feeder is, the, is made by First Nature. It's sold at Walmart. It comes in two sizes, a 16 ounce and a 32 ounce. Uh, the 16 ounce is less than $5. The 32 ounces, I know it's less than $10. But that bottom part, the red part, it um, unscrews and comes completely apart so that you can clean it. And that um, the, uh, the, the um, container that actually holds the nectar, the opening for that um, container is wide enough to use a regular scrub brush with so you don't have to have a special bottle brush or anything to clean it. Uh, these are very durable feeders. I've had some for years um, and as inexpensive as they are, you can have several around your yard. So the most important thing, those decorative feeders that have, um, you know, all the fancy glasswork and such, those are beautiful, but you might want to just put water in those and not sugar water for a hummingbird because they can be very hard to clean. Uh, and what do you put into the feeder? So the standard formula is one part sugar to four parts water, or a quarter of a cup of sugar to one cup of water. You can boil the water if you wish. I just use hot uh, tap water. You do not need to sterilize anything. You just need to make sure that everything's clean. So you wanna, if there's any black mold on your feeder, you wanna make sure that all of that is removed. 
um, you're going to put this right back outside so there's really no need to sterilize your, your feeders. And you want to hang these feeders in a visible location, ideally not in the sun, so maybe under the eaves or under a tree. Um, and as I said before, if you want to minimize the fighting, then you can hang the feeders out of sight of each other so that each hummingbird can pick a feeder to guard. Um, and remember that the, the reason you're putting the feeders out are for us to see the birds up close and personal. This particular feeder was right outside my kitchen window in my house in Baton Rouge. I think this was the fattest male ruby-throated hummingbird in North America. And you see his bloomers there at the bottom of his belly. Those are actually the feathers at the top of his legs. And um, he is so fat that it's forcing those bloomer feathers to stick out. So this is a, this is a guy that had tanked up and he's probably got a long, long way to go. He may have even been heading up to Canada for breeding. He was sucking it down too. So how often should you change the nectar? This is really important. So in the summer, like right now, when it's over 90 degrees every day, you should change that nectar every one to two days. You don't have to fill the feeder up. You can just put um, you know, a quarter of a cup of nectar in the feeders, especially if it's not being drained every day. Um, when it starts being drained every day, you might want to use a little bit more. In the winter time, when it's cooler, you might be able to do um, get away with um, only refilling every three to five days. And basically, the way to test this is as you're cleaning your feeder before you dump out the nectar, just smell it. And if it smells yeasty, then you've waited too long. It's already turned and this can be harmful for the hummingbirds. So if it looks cloudy, if it smells yeasty, then it is and you need to clean it more often. So, um, and if you are not gonna to, um, maintain the feeders, if they're just too much trouble, then please just take them down. Uh, I know I drive around town and I see feeders that obviously were put up you know, two years ago and have turned completely black. Um, there's no salvaging those feeders. They could, they could clean it with a bleach solution and they're not gonna get all the crud off of them. So um, if your feeders have gotten to that point, you just wanna toss those and start over again. And if you don't wanna maintain the feeders, then just take them down. It's important not to use red dye in your um, hummingbird nectar. Uh, they do sell it like this off the shelf or um, with the red dye built in, but Mother Nature doesn't use red dye in her flowers. Uh, she colors the flowers. Uh, so by the same token, we have feeders that have red in them. So we don't need to put um, red dye in the feeder. And the second really good reason is that it's expensive to use the pre-made nectar with the red dye. Um, this stuff is eight cups for five bucks, which is pretty cheap but you can get two bags of sugar for about the same rate. So um, make your own with just plain cane sugar and water. If you have trouble with bees or wasps or ants, here's a couple of tips. Um, use feeders that have no yellow parts. Bees and wasps are actually attracted to yellow. Use an ant moat, and I have, this, have it pictured here. Basically, it's just a cup that uh, has a hook at the top and the bottom. You fill that moat with water and then the ants cannot cross the, um, cross the, the hook to get down to the feeder. Uh, you wanna be sure not to use anything oily or sticky around the feeder. Um, some, I've seen people recommend this, but we already talked about the fact that, ruby, that hummingbirds fight each other. Um, and if one pushes the other one onto that Vaseline or onto that sticky stuff that you put on the feeder or around the feeder, uh, it actually may get on their feathers. They may not be able to remove it from their feathers and it may cause them harm. Uh, so you wanna be sure not to use anything sticky or oily. And then um, if you absolutely cannot deter the bees, wasps, or ants, then you probably will have to remove the feeder, move it first, try moving it to another location, and then um, take it down if they just cannot be deterred. Even better than the feeders though, uh, if you don't wanna maintain the feeders then do a little gardening. Uh, put some plants out that hummers love 
Um, basically, any kind of tubular flower, um, as you can see, this trumpet creeper, this hummingbird has his whole head up in the flower. Uh, Turk's cap is another favorite. There's some flat flowers like zinnias that they love as well. Zinnias, lantana, um, that have high sugar content and they also attract insects. You can get plants at most good nurseries, um, but I'll tell you the best way to get to stock up on hummingbird plants is to find a friend that loves hummingbirds and get some pass along plants because uh, hummingbird, hummingbird plant lovers generally uh, have plenty to share. On the Baton Rouge Audubon uh, website, uh, we have a list, it's actually a whole page on feeding hummingbirds uh, that includes a list of hummingbird plants that are very high in, in sugar um, and very attractive to, um, to hummingbirds. So visit our website um, for that list. We all know that hummingbirds are amazing flyers. Um, they are the only, humming, only bird uh, that can fly forward, backward, sideways, and hover. So basically they can move in any direction. Their wings actually move in a figure eight shape as opposed to just up and down like most other birds do. And their wings beat 50 to 70 times a second. So in the time that it takes to say one Mississippi, their wings have moved 50 to 70 times. So if you've ever tried to take a picture of a hummingbird and had the, the, um, the wings uh, be in stop motion, uh, you know why that's a difficult thing to do because they're moving so incredibly fast. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about hummingbirds is that although they do perch, they do sit still um, about 60% of the time actually, they don't fly all the time. Um, they, they sit still but they cannot walk. Uh, their feet, their legs are so, so short, uh, they could maybe shuffle, but if one lit on your finger and had to move to the end of your finger, it would have to fly up and fly back down again, you cannot walk. A hummingbird, a ruby-throated hummingbird is about the size of your thumb, uh, about three inches. And normally, um, for most of the year, they weigh slightly more than a penny, about three grams, give or take. But when they're preparing for migration, they double their body weight and they might weigh as much as a nickel, those little fatties. Speaking of migration, uh, the ruby-throated hummingbird, you can see by this, um, this map that the winter range for the ruby-throated hummingbird is down in Central America. And then in migration in the yellow, um, and the orange is their breeding territory. So as I said, most of the eastern part of the United States, east of the Rockies, they start their migration from Mexico and Central America in February. Um, the males always come first to establish a territory and then the females follow a week or two later. Uh, some of them will fly over land, so they'll take the around the Gulf route um, up through Mexico and Texas and on in dispersing across the eastern United States. Some will fly straight over the Gulf of Mexico over 600 miles in one fell swoop. Uh, if they have a tailwind, it may take them 18 hours to get across the Gulf. If they run into storms or weather, um, it may take them much, much longer, which is the reason that they have to double their body weight before they attempt this arduous task. Um, it is very demanding process for these little guys. Uh, this photo was taken um, by a Facebook friend of mine. She was watching her feeder one day and saw this little bird perch and then just suddenly zoop, over upside down. This is not normal. Obviously this little guy was completely exhausted from his migratory trip. But he did, he was okay. She, she took the picture and then went out and started to touch him and he woke up and flew away. So hopefully he, um, he got enough sustenance to keep going. So this is a map that shows the different uh, dates when, hum when ruby-throated hummingbirds arrive in the eastern part of the U.S. Uh, in Louisiana, especially southeast Louisiana, it's around the first of March of the, for the first ones. Uh, with the peak really being in the first part of April. 
Uh, and then it takes all the way into May before they get up to Canada. So we'll see them in, in March. We'll see them in pretty much the whole month of April. Uh, things really taper off into May. And um, everybody asks, where'd my hummingbirds go? Well, they're busy. For one thing, there's lots of natural food out there, so uh, they, can, they don't need to come to our feeders, plus they're nesting. Uh, the other thing is, is with all the, the, um, the plants leafing out, they're hard to see. Uh, one of the, um, the um, protective um, mechanisms that hummingbirds have, obviously, is their ability to camouflage. And so uh, they may be there and you're just not seeing them because they are hidden in the trees. What about hummingbird nests? So hummingbird nests are obviously tiny. Uh, this is one that was found at Blue Bonnet Swamp a couple of years ago, not by me, but somebody showed me uh, the nest. This is the ruby-throated hummingbird in the process of making the nest, and she can see her stamping her tiny, tiny feet down on the bottom of the nest to tamp down um, the materials that she's using, and then she uses her rounded belly to make the cup shape. Uh, mating starts as soon as the hummingbirds arrive from the wintering grounds. So the males come first, they stake out the territory, uh, they start getting ready to woo the females as soon as they arrive. The males will perform the shovel display for the female uh, to impress her. So he uses his voice, he'll use that pretty red throat, uh, do this fancy display uh, to impress the female. Uh, they will have a relationship that lasts about that long and then he's done and he's off drinking with the boys while she's doing all the work. So the female constructs the nest, the female takes care of the babies. In fact, she may, um, she may actually have two or even three broods in the southern part of the U.S. where the season is very long. This nest that she's making, the whole nest could fit into half of an Easter egg. That's how small the nest is. And ruby-throated hummingbirds usually locate their nests near natural bodies of water, lakes, and rivers, and bayous. And usually the nest is 10 to 40 feet in the air on a, a deciduous branch of a deciduous tree. Um, they make their nest of spider webs and soft plant down, like thistle down, and they cover the nest with lichen from this, the host tree for camouflage. So it really does look like a bump on a log. So if you ever find a hummingbird nest uh, in a tree, you're really doing something because they are deliberately very, very well hidden. So why do you think they use spider webs to construct their nest? See, Nanette said strength. That's true. That is one of the factors. There's something else more important, possibly. Sticky, yes, um, although they, do, they actually use the, the um, so the spider webs have two um, different uh, features. They can be strong and they can be um, sticky. They, they use the, the stronger filaments, right? So Marie said it expands with the growing chicks. That's exactly right. This, the spider webs are stretchy. So the eggs, when they're laid, this is a toothpick laid over a hummingbird nest. So a toothpick is what, an, half, an inch and a half or so long. Um, this shows you how tiny that nest is and these two eggs are about the size of Tic Tacs. So as those babies grow, that nest that's made of, um, of spider webs and thistle, thistle down, soft plant down, it actually expands uh, to allow the babies to grow. So it's stretchy. Those eggs are laid one to two days apart. And the egg, if, if we had babies this big compared to the size of the, boar, of the bird, they would be 25 pounders. And she's carrying two of them around. So bless her tiny little heart. So these babies are ready to fledge within 21 days of birth. Um, this video that I found online on YouTube shows um, the mother uh, hummingbird feeding the babies 
Uh, this looks like a sword saw swallowing act in the circus. I mean, she is poking that bill or bill all the way down to the bottom of those birds. Um, she has created a slurry of insects and nectar uh, that she's feeding to these babies. The insects are critical. The protein is critical for the development of those baby birds. Uh, so she's feeding uh, these baby birds that mixture. And uh, the mother may actually start a second nest uh, before these babies have even fledged. And they'll continue to care for those fledged babies uh, for a couple of weeks after they're out of the nest. Um, the nest is usually very well hidden. So that, that previous um, uh, video showed the nest basically out in the open. Most of the time the nest is very, very well camouflaged. This is a nest that I found in, uh, in California that was an Anna's hummingbird. So I found it as she was constructing the nest and I was there visiting my daughter's family. So I, I showed her where the nest was. You had to stand at a certain point in the stairwell to see the nest at about eye, eye level. And uh, I showed her where the nest was and asked her to keep, a, keep an eye on it. And um, she messaged me later and she said, Mama, I can't find it. I cannot find this hummingbird nest. Even though you showed me exactly where to stand and I'm trying, trying to look where you told me, I cannot find the nest. Uh, so we didn't get to watch this mama hummingbird go through her whole chick rearing process. And then after the babies are, um, are all, after they're done with all the baby making, uh, they're going to head south again in the fall. I usually tell people uh, if you haven't been maintaining feeders to put them back up on the 4th of July. That's an easy date to remember uh, for us in South Baton Rouge. And then um, or South Louisiana rather. Uh, and then through August, you'll see the numbers increasing and September is the peak of uh, fall migration. Uh, this particular house is in St. Francisville. This is a few years ago. This gentleman in mid-September would have 50 feeders going and he would use as much as 50 pounds of sugar a week feeding these hummingbirds. Um, he liked these strawberry um, feeders uh, these, I would not recommend it. They look really nice, but they're hard to clean. Uh, he eventually did change them out for many of the First Nature feeders. Uh, but he was kept very, very busy making sugar water and keeping his feeders clean for his hummingbirds that came through. It was, an, it was so impressive. I, we estimated that at any given time, he would have well over a thousand hummingbirds. And the collective hum of all those birds sounded like a roar when you were right there on this patio. It was just incredible. So for you at your home, if you've been maintaining those feeders and you maybe have had a few in your yard and one on each side of the house to keep them from fighting, uh, in September, as those numbers increase, you can try adding a few more feeders and you may get these, these hummingbird swarms uh, that you've seen on um, on Facebook and, uh, and other people talk about sometimes. Uh, this, this was my swarm in Ponchatoula, um, not last year, but the year before. I didn't have this last year. For whatever reason, uh, they did not find me, even though I added more feeders, I never had this many birds at one time. Um, so you never know. Uh, the the St. Francisville area uh, does seem to be on the Hummingbird Highway. And uh, those folks up there are very lucky to see lots and lots of hummingbirds in the fall. So how do we know about hummingbirds? What, what are the, what, how do we know like how long hummingbirds live and where do they move, how do they move around, that kind of thing? Um, one of the research uh, mechanisms that they use is hummingbird banding. Um, so they will band the bird with a unique um, aluminum band that contains letters and numbers that are unique to this individual. So this particular bird is a female Rufus hummingbird that was banded in my yard in January of 2006. Um, it was recovered for four years in my yard, um, the last time in January of 2009. So for four years, this hummingbird crossed the continent, the North American continent, uh, 
from its breeding ground in the upper Rockies, possibly as far away as British Columbia or Canada, uh, to a particular shrub in my yard in Baton Rouge. That is pretty, pretty impressive. So how do they catch them? So banders use these special um, uh, traps, if you will. So they'll, they'll put the trap up on a, around a feeder that is a normal, normally visited feeder, and the trap has a remotely controlled do door. Um, and so when the, the hummingbird goes into the cage to, um, to feed, then the, they close the door and trap the bird. Um, then somebody reaches in very carefully and gets that bird and puts it in a soft cloth bag until it's banded. Hummingbirds can only be handled by licensed certified banders. And it's actually more difficult to get a, um, a certification for hummingbird banding than it is regular bird banding. So there aren't very many hummingbird banders around in North America. Um, all of this data, anytime birds are banded, all of the data goes into a central database in Maryland, in Patuxent, Maryland. Um, to keep track of all of the birds. So, and this banding has proved that birds return to the same location year after year. Um, as I said, that bird was banded in my yard. We caught her again, we looked at the band, we knew that it was the same individual. Um, I, get, I, I get pretty consistently people talk about their hummingbirds. My hummingbird does this. My hummingbird hovers outside my window and tells me when it's time to change my feeder. My hummingbird always, you know, chances are that's not the same hummingbird every time because um, hummingbird behavior tends to be uh, pretty predictable. And really the only way to know uh, that a, a hummingbird is a particular individual is if it's banded and marked. So this is a, um, a very close, <laughs> A uh, macro picture of a hummingbird band on uh, the tip of my finger. And then uh, this is the hummingbird band on the hummer's leg. And you can actually read the numbers there. Uh, so people have actually been able to take pictures of hummingbird bands on uh, hummingbirds on their feeders and, and read the numbers enough to identify the bird. Uh, the humming, these hummingbird bands come in a sheet of, I think of a hundred, um, from the, um, the banding uh, laboratory and the hummingbird banders have to cut them out and process them and then they store them on a diaper pin um, according to male and female uh, until they're used. So when a, hummingbird, when a hummingbird bander is banding the bird, the very first thing it does is determine if it's a male or a female because there are separate bands for male and female. And they install the, um, the band first and then they inspect the bird and they measure it and weigh it. Um, they look for things like um, fat. So they the amount of fat determines whether or not that bird is prepared for migration. If it has zero fat or only one fat, um, a, a fat content of one, uh, then that bird is probably not going anywhere. If that bird has a higher measurement of fat, then it's probably on its way in migration. They'll, they'll look at the bill, they'll look for corrugations on the bill, uh, little tiny ridges. Um, that actually uh, tells the bander if that's a hatch year bird. If the bird was born that year, it will have ridges on the bill, and uh, otherwise it'll be an after hatch year bird. There's no way really to determine how old that bird is. Uh, all they can determine is that it's after hatch year. So this is Dave Patton, who's a bander in Lafayette, Louisiana, uh, processing this bird. So you can see how docile this hummingbird is while he's um, processing it. It's just lying there in his hand. It's not struggling. It's not crying. Um, and he, of course, he's being very gentle. And he's done this a lot. He first used the tweezers to move the feathers out from the leg so that he could use the special pliers to install the band. And then he's using the tweezers to turn the band around on the leg just to make sure it's not going to get caught. And then he's going to use the calipers to crimp it. Um, and attach it permanently to the leg. Now, this is interesting. He's using a straw and he's blowing on the feathers, blowing, blowing the feathers away from the belly of the bird, looking for fat. And you can see the little sugar belly there. And that is what he uses to determine 
the level of fat on this bird. So this bird has is carrying a little bit of fat, it would probably be certainly greater than uh, a zero or a one. And he's looking at the, um, the tail feathers to see if the, the bird has molted and such. Doing some measurements there. If you ever get a chance to see the banding process, it's really cool. Um, and if you're lucky, you may, be, you may be the person that gets to hold that hummingbird at the end. Uh, a hummingbird in the hand feels like a feather with a heartbeat. I mean, you can, you can feel a little bit of warmth in your hand, but it's so light uh, that you, you really can't feel the weight of the bird. Uh, but you can feel the little bit of vibration from the heartbeat. Uh, after the bird is banded, they put a little bit of paint. It's a water-soluble paint, um, like a whiteout for typing, um, that they put on the, uh, the crown of the bird. Uh, that's going to wear off over time as the bird molts. Um, and uh, they'll release that bird. And the reason that they mark the bird is so that they don't trap it again and again and keep processing and stressing it out. Banding lets us know things like how long hummingbirds live. So for ruby-throated hummingbirds, uh, it's an average of three to five years with the females usually living longer. Um, and then the record for a hummingbird is a broad-tailed hummingbird in Colorado uh, that lived to be over 12 years old. So what about, so if you put your feeders up in March when they first arrive from um, Central America and you put them up in July after the breeding is done, when should you take your feeders down? Well, if you listen to your grandmother, you have to take your feeders down around Labor Day because if you don't, then none of the hummingbirds are going to migrate like they're supposed to. Uh, that's an old wives tale, <laughs> uh, but that is what a lot of people have been told that you have to take your feeder down around Labor Day. That's actually too early. Uh, around here, it would be more like the beginning of October rather than um, the beginning of September for sure, because the peak of migration is in September. But you're not going to often see um, video of a hummingbird in the snow. This is in my yard in Baton Rouge uh, a few years ago when we had one of the snowstorms. Uh, this was, I believe, in January. Um, and this is a rufous hummingbird. Uh, obviously, there's not a lot of insects for her to eat, so she was heavily relying on the nectar in that feeder um, during this snowstorm. So in South Louisiana, basically the answer to when should you take your feeders down is don't. Um, because even though the ruby-throated hummingbirds um, have gone, there are other hummingbirds that come to Louisiana and spend the winter along the Gulf South. So this, um, this period, the second season actually starts in August. We've already had a, had a record uh, or two here in Louisiana of Rufus hummingbird. So our winter hummingbirds, um, how, do you, how do you get them to come to your yard? Basically leave those feeders up and keep them clean. Very, very important to keep them clean. Um, you want to plant uh, some plants that flower in the winter. We have some that will, um, will flower up until we get a very, very hard freeze. Things like ugly shrimp plant, um, the orange abutilon, um, fire spike, uh, to name a few, uh, that will sustain through the fall and uh, late fall and even, even early winter but also cover plants, so live oaks, um, um, evergreen, broadleaf evergreens like citrus trees and ligustrum, God help them, um, things like that will actually provide good cover for hummingbirds in the winter time. And then if your yard has a lot of bird activity, um, it's believed that hummingbirds are attracted to that activity, they get kind of curious and if they find what they need, once they arrive in your yard, then they may stay. So here, we're going to run few, through a few of the hummingbirds that come to Louisiana in the winter time. The most prevalent species for the winter is the rufous hummingbird. Uh, you're going to know, if you see a male rufous hummingbird, you're going to know that this is a different type of hummingbird. It is this goldish color. Um, the gorget on an adult male is this beautiful uh, red gold uh, flashy color. 
Uh, this particular video is of a, an immature male rufous hummingbird that spent the winter in my yard here in Ponchatoula uh, the first year that I came. And he would stay in the azalea bush right outside my kitchen window, which is what allowed me to take that up close video. Uh, so the, the, and here's the female Rufus. Um, I love that she posed perfectly in the tree that was turning the fall color. So I got the greens and the golds and the rust of the tree as well as the bird. Uh, so she looks uh, more like a uh, ruby throated hummingbird in the fact that she has a green back, but she also has rust on the sides and she has a little bit of a gorget as well, sort of a triangular shaped gorget. The Rufus hummingbird, you can see according to this map, this is the breeding territory of the Rufus hummingbird all the way up to Alaska, British Columbia, up into um, the Pacific Northwest and Northern Rockies. So these birds come all the way across most of the continent uh, to get to the Gulf South and spend the winter. Pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, second most prevalent winter hummingbird is the black chin. And I said earlier, this is one that is often mistaken for a ruby throat. In fact, it's in the same genus, Archilochus. Uh, the male, the, you can see the purple band at the bottom there. It will never have a completely purple uh, gorget all the way up to the bottom of the bill. It's just purple around the bottom and then it's black above that. Um, the female looks almost identical to a, a female ruby-throated hummingbird, and then the male might have just a little spot of purple there. In fact, here are a ruby-throated and a black-chinned hummingbird, um, neither one showing the color of their gorget, and they look virtually identical. The black-chinned range map um, is, um, a very western species, so where you saw the ruby throat was basically all east of the Rockies, the black chin is all west of the Rockies. And then we have the calliope. Uh, this is one of my favorites. It's actually um, the smallest bird in North America outside of Cuba with the bee hummingbird. Uh, it's the, sort of the, the uh, pot-bellied pig of the, of the hummingbird world because it's very short and stout but it's got that wonderful flared gorget uh, that's kind of a magenta color. Uh, this little guy, um, Dennis Demchek in Baton Rouge, uh, had him in his yard for five years in a row. And he allowed me to take that video from standing about three feet away from him. So he was very confiding to me. And, and be impressed with the fact that the calliope breeds in the upper Pacific Northwest, um, up into Canada, uh, and then this little bird, we're supposed to go to Southern Mexico, a few of them end up in the Gulf South. Look how far the tiny, this tiny, tiny bird has to fly. Really impressive. The females, as I said, they're very hard to tell apart. This is three different species of hummingbird, um, but look virtually identical. You might guess that the one in the lower left is the calliope because it actually does look like I've described the pot-bellied pig of the, of the uh, hummingbird world. Um, here you have a ruby-throated, a calliope, and a black chin female. So if you end up with a female winter hummingbird, you're probably going to have to have an expert help you to tell, uh, tell them apart. And we have the, uh, the piece de resistance for winter hummingbirds. This is the buff-bellied hummingbird. You will know if you have a buff belly. He is twice the size of a ruby-throated hummingbird. He has that red bill, that acid green turquoise throat. Did you catch that flare? Um, he has that rusty color under the tail and of course the buff, um, the buff belly. Uh, he sounds different because it's just the wings sound different, the voice sounds different because it's just a much bigger hummingbird. These, hum these hummingbirds love tangles. Uh, they love to hide in vines. Um, and so if you have a, a wild yard, uh, they're really going to enjoy that. Um, there have been buff-bellied hummingbirds at Blue Bonnet Swamp in Baton Rouge the past few years. Uh, they will come out to the feeders. Um, for very short periods of time, but they love all the tangles and the understory at Blue Bonnet Swamp. So 
So, oh, this is a slow motion video of this, um, this buck belly just for kicks. And it's really fun to see him flare out that throat and show all the colors of turquoise, turquoise, the acid green, the rust of the under side of the tail. Just a beautiful, beautiful bird. I have never had a roof, uh, roof uh, sorry, a buff belly hummingbird in my yard, but I aspire to. Pretty wonderful. The buff belly, uh, he's actually doing a reverse migration. So he is um, a, a Mexican and a very southwestern bird, and he is actually migrating north in the winter time. Um, so they don't come in great numbers. Um, but we certainly expect them to be here uh, in the Gulf South. And then a few others that have been uh, seen in uh, Louisiana in the winter, the Allen's hummingbird, which looks very much like the Rufus, the broad build, uh, which is a very dark hummingbird with a gorgeous royal blue throat and a red bill, and then the broad tail hummingbird, which if you've been to Colorado in the summertime, I'm sure you've seen them with the acid um, magenta throat. And this chart just shows the prevalence of the different types of hummingbirds in the winter, um, predominantly rufous, a few overwintering ruby-throated, and then it breaks down into the other species um, that have, have been noted in uh, the last couple of decades. So we want to know if you see hummingbirds in the wintertime. Um, Eric Johnson with um, Audubon, Louisiana, uh, has been tasked with um, keeping track of these hummingbirds in the winter. So, uh, and he's already started his second season, his winter list, um, because we have actually had uh, hummingbirds show up in, um, uh, Western hummingbirds show up in Louisiana already. Uh, so you send an email to Eric and he will distribute a list of all the hummingbirds, the, the winter hummingbirds that are seen around Louisiana over the winter. It's really interesting information too. So this is a case, um, one of the reasons that they ban hummingbirds and keep track of this information is to, um, to, to absolutely see where these hummingbirds are going. So a Rufus hummingbird was banded in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, so central or eastern Florida. It was recaptured in Chenega Bay, Alaska, which as the hummingbird flies, a distance of 3,530 miles. Um, and they absolutely know it was that bird because of the band. So it undoubtedly did not take a direct route. It probably flew um, south across the desert and then north along the coast. There's no way to really tell. Um, but uh, this absolutely proves that these birds are moving across the continent. I've had people tell me that, oh, well, you just didn't notice that that Rufus hummingbird was staying in your yard year round. And yeah, I would notice. <laughs> I'm looking at the birds in my yard every day. I would know if there was a little rusty one hanging out. Um, but this is really, really exciting when they recapture banded birds. Uh, so your job now that you've learned all about hummingbirds is to just enjoy them. Hang a feeder out, hang some feeders. Uh, plant some flower, flowers, even better. Um, report when you see them first in the spring or in the winter. And if you see anything unusual, be sure to report those as well. Uh, here's my email address. Um, you can also get to me on the um, Baton Rouge Audubon website. Uh, there's a place to uh, email questions if you ever have a question about hummingbirds or any kind of bird. Um, and then we have a new page, birdlouisiana.org, that has all sorts of Louisiana-related birding information. Um, and be sure to visit that for more information. I will stop sharing there. And we'll go and look at questions and answers. <clears throat> Amber, did you see anything that we need to um, address as far as questions? There were just a couple clarification questions. Um, when you were talking about iridescence, uh, when you were showing that photo of the back of the birds, did the females and the males have iridescence? Yes. So they don't, the females do not have the color on the throat, um, but basically all of the feathers 
of, um, of hummingbirds have some iridescence to them. And so they will look different colors in different light. Um, you know, people will say, well, well, mine's not green, it's gray. Um, but that's just because of the way that the light was, was shining on the bird and it looked like it looked a different color. Let's see, and then a clarification. So the, the birds that we see now, are they are mar migrating south right now. Is that yes. correct? Okay. Right. Our resident passed. birds have probably already moved out. And so the ones that we're seeing are migrants. And, um, and, and there's really no way to tell if the hummingbird you're seeing at your feeder today is the same one that you saw at your feeder yesterday. It could be. But it could also be that the bird you saw yesterday is already south of us. You know, it's already on its, um, its way out. Uh, so the really the only way to know for sure is if the bird is banded or marked. Um, you can get some idea if, uh, if, if it's a, an immature male, for example, and has a couple of gorget feathers and you see that same pattern repeatedly. Uh, but if it's a female or a male, an adult male, there's really no way to tell them. Let's see. Uh, someone asked, do you know if they're going to have the Hummingbird Festival this year? No, no festivals. No. No, too many people, too close together, crowded around trying to see them band the hummingbirds, just asking for trouble. So they will not have the, the festival this year. Hopefully, we'll be back to normal with all of that next year because that really is a sight to see. Uh, and, and it's a wonderful experience to share with people, especially with kids. They get really excited about it. Let's see. Uh, someone asked how they measure the fat, but I think the video covered that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is it unusual for them to winter over in Atlanta? Um, I, I, I think that there are probably fewer in Atlanta than there are on the, in the Gulf Coast. Uh, just because Atlanta is at a higher um, latitude than us. But um, there have been records of rufous hummingbirds in uh, Pennsylvania and Arkansas and uh, Delaware and, you know, sporadically all along the east. Uh, so it's very possible that um, a few rufous hummingbirds might show up there. Let's see. We have a, a ruby throated that hangs out. Mm -hmm. I think it's hung out for say one or two of them all winter long. We don't have a lot that come, but we do have some. But yeah. uh, we've been having fairly mild winters, so that may be why. Mm -hmm. That's probably why, yep. Yeah. Is there any particular place in town where you see more? Magnolia Woods um, is probably the the heaviest concentration of winter hummingbirds in Baton Rouge. Um, it'd be Magnolia Woods in the Garden District, and that is undoubtedly because of the live oak cover. Um, so you get a lot, and you know, we know live oaks, our oaks are good for insects. Um, wintering hummingbirds eat a lot of insects. They do a lot of insect gathering. Um, so the, the live oaks provide the insects and they provide the cover. It kind of keeps things warmer with that cover as well. Uh, so that is absolutely the highest concentration. See, there's a question. Does the mother bird bring the juveniles to the feeders? To, I guess to show them where it is? To show well, them for the first so, time? So yes, I mean, mother birds tend to train the juveniles um, for some time. And I even, one time I actually witnessed um, a mother hummingbird feeding a juvenile out of the nest. Um, but I don't know. I think they, they're, the time that they care for the juveniles is probably very brief. Um, so the juveniles may be kind of, you know, on their own to follow the adults and figure out what they're supposed to be doing. I've seen uh, juvenile birds look at the feeder and try to figure it out, like they're, you know, poking all over the place to try to figure out where they're supposed to feed. Um, so they're probably looking to the, um, uh, to the parents for guidance there but um you know I, I i don't know if i said this out loud that that video that i showed of all the hummingbirds in my yard in september um the caption was there's no such thing as a flock of hummingbirds 
So hummingbirds do not cooperate. They are not flying with each other. They all just happen to be in the same place at the same time, um, but they are not together. <laughs> They're each out for themselves. Let's see, I see one last question about twisted beaks. Do you know anything about that? Is it unusual? Um, so, I mean, you know, in, in any bird species, you can find deformities and problems, um, broken beaks, twisted beaks, that kind of thing. Uh, so I would say in the whole sense of all the population is probably unusual. Whether or not it would be detrimental to the bird is difficult to say. Uh, so as long as it can figure out how to feed itself with that, with the beak like that, and it may be able to, then it could probably survive. Other questions? Did we hit them all? I think so. All right. I'll go stop the recording here, and now I have to get onto Facebook and uh, apologize to everybody. <laughs> <laughs>